I am Andy Chase's stand-in. I, I am not Andy Chase. My name is David Bossi. I am uh, the librarian at the Memorial Libraries here in Deerfield. So I know, I, it's nice to see so many familiar faces. I know some of you have used our collections. Uh, for those of you who haven't, if you would like to know more, I have brought some uh, flyers, so you're, you're welcome to pick these up. Uh, they're out at the registration table give an overview of uh, what we do at the library. Um, my role is today is just to uh, do the credits. Um, I know no one wants to uh, hear the opening act, so I'm going to make this quick. Um, so we, we owe uh, Andy Chase and Eagle Brook our thanks for, for hosting us today, for providing refreshments, and also for the lunch. So let's let's put our hands together, even though he's not here. Uh, so uh, today's conference was the brainchild of uh, Lester Garvin and Bud Driver. They did a lot of the organizational work. Um, they were assisted by uh, a planning committee consisted of David Brule, John Nove, and Diane Snyder. Uh, Tim Newman, the uh, director of the Pecumtuck Valley Memorial Association, also down the road. Hopefully you've all been there. It's a, a great museum and a great organization. Uh, Tim was involved in planning and PVMA provided uh, logistical support for the planning of this conference. And I, I particularly want to acknowledge um, Dr. Uh, Richard Michael Gramley, who is the chair of the Western Massachusetts chapter of the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. They really sponsoring the, the conference and um, Mike Gramley, who will be speaking later, was uh, very much involved in uh, getting the slate of speakers together. So thank you to him. And I think we all just want to get started. So if Bud Driver is here, not but I was just going to... This is not my driver, I've been told. Um, someone is going to introduce our first speaker, Richard Little. He, here he comes. Late as always. <laughs> Thank you, bud. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Um, my name is Bud Driver, and it gives me great pleasure in welcoming you to our Massachusetts Archaeological Western Chapter Conference on Cultural Sequencing of the Connecticut River Drainage System, starting from the time of the ancient Lake Hitchcock. A most gracious thank you to Eagle Brook School for supporting and hosting us with venue and lunch. I also want to thank all you scientists that came today to support the new process for archaeology for uh, accountability and transparency. Professor Dick Little has been our Valley's in-house geologist for over 40 years on how the Valley was formed through mountain building and erosional processes. He has always had an open door policy for mentoring and has inspired thousands of students such as myself over his ongoing career. Please join me in welcoming Dick Little. Okay, thank, thank you very much, bud. I need to stay away from the speaker because this is going to squeak terribly, I think. But in any event, uh, I have one of the world's hardest jobs here, and that is to summarize uh, Western Massachusetts geology into 30 minutes. So I did bring my clock. Uh, but I set the alarm at one hour. So. <laughs> and so, uh, let's just get started. And also, I must say that uh, due to a family medical situation that's not life-threatening, but still, uh, my poor wife got up and could barely move this morning due to a back injury. When she was a kid, she had horses. And let me tell you, folks, don't have horses and kids together. <laughs> anyway, they fall off, right? And then uh, 60 years, well, no, 50 years later, <clears throat> you end up with the consequences. OK, so if I can turn this on, this should be the pointer. 
Hey, that works. All right, so let's see how we can do here if the advancer will work. Uh, first of all, thanks to Bud. I learned over the years so much about archaeology of the local area. He's been so, uh, so kind to take me places and show me things, and we've had lots of discussions, and um, what a guy. He's quite the resource to have in your backyard. So uh, anyway, if no one's ever given Bud a hand, I'm sure you have. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, the title of this topic, and pardon me if I am, maybe I'll just get up here, how's this? Uh, okay, closer look at primal inhabitants, and I was going through my slides, and I said, oh yeah, I've got one of those pictures. Uh, okay, you know, I can't help it, but I do put some humor into my programs. So, we're looking at the geology of the Connecticut River Valley here today, and this is the best place in the world to study geology. So, let's look at what we have here. This is the Holyoke Range, of course, and um, can I see how many people are not from the Connecticut Valley? So we have a bunch of people that uh, maybe have never seen the Holyoke Range. That's probably not true. But we're air viewing the Holyoke Range here, looking south. So we have dinosaur footprints and sediment. Gentlemen, here we go. <laughs> Let's get that dinosaur moving. There we go. Okay, so anyway, we have uh, dinosaur footprints, lava flow, everything you see here. Um, I only have a thousand slides, so I have to move pretty quickly. This is the statement. You can read it. All right. So, valley archaeology is not too bad either. So, let's take a look at the, our geological story. And if we put the geological time scale across our outstretched arms, we see how the various eras kind of settle out across your body. We're going to look at the Paleozoic first, and we start with North America, way back at the beginning of the Paleozoic, on its side, south of the equator even. But New England is not even here yet, at least most of New England. New England is a series of islands that's offshore and moving towards North America, perhaps 500 miles away out into that early Atlantic Ocean the Atlantic Ocean before the present. Now, as you probably know about plate tectonics, as these plates move, they have to override, or the ocean crust has to get out of the way. It has to go under, that's called subduction, and I think everybody has probably heard about this. <clears throat> Our shoreline would have been like the Pacific Northwest, erupting volcanoes, really very beautiful. You're here, if you were here, and that, of course, is the process of subduction. Now, something you don't know. The world's only subduction joke. <laughs> okay, ducks on a pond, they dive. Subduction. <laughs> okay, now that might be outrageous. However, oops, what do we um, but you know, it does illustrate the process of going down under. Okay, I didn't think that was so bad. <laughs> anyway, here we are. Uh, we have all this subduction going on, New England is being built, pieces are, of continents are crashing into us, and if we take a look at where North America has been over 750 million years, it's going to scrape up next to South America, and it's going to come around, finally crashing into North Africa, and that's going to build the Appalachian Mountains and make Pangaea. How's that for Paleozoic in about one minute? <laughs> So the evidence of all this, of course, is rocks. When you look at the rocks of our region, loads of metamorphic Canadian intrusions. Gneisses, of course, are here. Marbles and slates are particularly interesting, I think, because these are the old ocean rocks before Pangaea. Between every continent, there is an ocean. How about that for a simple concept? You probably knew. <laughs> And the sediments in those oceans, and so when you bring the continents together, everything's going to squeeze up, become uh, metamorphic eventually. And marble slate, these are the old ocean muds that were before Pangaea in that old ocean. Now, if you take a look at this great uh, website from the U.S. Geological Survey, I'm not sure how many people are used to going to this site, but it's absolutely incredible because you can take your cursor and you can click on any given point here, and what will um, happen is a pop-up that will give you the geological formation and some data about it. So, absolutely terrific. 
Uh, I have a handout today, a blue handout. It's probably on one of the front tables. And you can find this or just Google uh, Geology Map Massachusetts or wherever, and it will come up so you can easily find this site. So what we find here, as we look at the Northeast, look at New England, you see that there are all these uh, <coughs> stripes of metamorphic rocks, and we have the Mesozoic Age connected valley, which you can see right here, that little inlay right there, it comes later, it doesn't come to the Mesozoic. So it's not around here during those collisions that happens later. So if we take a look at uh, where we are here in New England, there's lots of granite, those kind of pinkish, pinkish areas that look like they kind of push into the other uh, rocks. Those are the granites. And of course, you know, granite is a metamorph, excuse me, <laughs> granite is a magma chamber rock. Uh, came in as a liquid, pushed its way through other rocks and solidified uh, magma chamber granite. And we also have lots of long bedrock layers that are pretty much oriented north-south, these long bedrock layers that are metamorphic. Now, why do we have so many of these Paleozoic age rocks like you see? Well, we had Pangea, we had a collision of continents. And when you get a collision, as we see here from this map in Vermont, geological map of Vermont, look at the cross-sections of Vermont here. You can see how those layers are going upward and they are pushed over just like having a collision from the right to the left, just taking everything, smoothing and pushing it one layer over the other by the heavy powers. Um, and then we have this doming effect that happens also as hard materials rise from below, either as metamorphic or maybe as intrusions or so on the surrounding. So it's like uh, being caught in a giant vice that creates the New England um, rocky underpants. Or perhaps being in a car crash. So notice that compression is the process, folding is the result, and note the orientation of the folds that's perpendicular to the compression. And that's why when you look at New England, you see all those linear folds, all those linear outcrops that go in the north-south direction because the collision came from the east. Testing one, two, three, four. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Anyway, um, thank you, Diane. So here we have our bedrock outcrops. That's the Mesozoic age of the valley right in here. And this has been called an inlay into the rocks of New England because it came later. It's like so let's take a closer look at that. So as we uh, finish up the Paleozoic, we've got Pangea, we've got the Appalachian Mountains. Got the great old supercontinent there. And we're now going to go to the Mesozoic. So as we go to the Mesozoic, what's going to happen is we're going to break Pangaea. So in the Mesozoic, we break Pangaea. In the Paleozoic, we make Pangaea. And just in case you're having trouble with those concepts and the timing, remember this. If it's uh, Paleozoic, starts with a P. We get Pangaea, starts with a P. So Pangaea, Paleozoic. And then we get to the Mesozoic. We're going to break Pangaea. And as I tell my students, so they'll get this right on the test, when you break anything, you make a mess. <laughs> Mesozoic. See, that's a bad one. That one is definitely bad. So in any event, however, it might help you remember the timing of our geological events. So let's move on. Here's the big story about breaking Pangaea. We're going to get rift valleys, and we are in a right on the edge, or actually kind of right in the middle of this rift valley that has a, a fault. Oops, wrong button. Has a fault called the Eastern Border Fault. It's over on the eastern side of the valley. How's that for a good guess? Right on the eastern side of our valley. It goes all the way from Keene, New Hampshire, to uh, Hartford, excuse me, New Haven, past New Haven, out in the ocean. So we have this long fault, we have this rift valley, and that's what happens when you pull up our continents. Now here's one out near Yellowstone Park in Montana. And when you have a rift valley, you find there are mountains on the upside of the fault. The fault creates the valley. It's usually a very long, linear uh, geological situation here. Faults tend to be long and linear. 
and the valley drops down the mountains erode to get alluvial fans like you see here, shorelines and lake beds in the valley floor. And so Death Valley is another great place to see this. It's mountains that fall, alluvial fans, shorelines and lake beds. And you know, all of these deposits that are happening in this Rift Valley, this is the red rock that we see up and down the Connecticut Valley today. So, for instance, if you're up on the old alluvial fans, you'll get gravels, now a conglomerate. Shorelines, you'll get the sands. If you're on the lake bed, you'll get silty clay shales. Uh, you can see mud cracks and even raindrop impressions there on that sample. Dinosaurs love to walk along the old lake shores, also leaving their footprints in the mud. Okay, now, where did the study of dinosaur footprints begin? In the whole world, it began in Greenfield, Massachusetts, just up the road. I taught at Greenfield Community College, still do, actually. So, um, this is one of our big claims to fame. We were the place where dinosaur footprints were first discovered, and studied, that is, first studied. Okay, the man that, um, that found these was a stonemason, Dexter Marsh. And Dexter did a great job of collecting. He basically was um, obsessed with finding these dinosaur footprints, and he worked very hard at it. He actually made a museum of dinosaur footprints in his house, which the town of Greenfield, in its great wisdom way back when he died, or near when he died, decided not to purchase. <laughs> and so this great collection has been dispersed. And Greenfield sunk back into all of these. <laughs> okay. uh, oops, what happened to Edward Hitchcock? <laughs> uh, gee, there was usually a picture of Edward Hitchcock there. That is funny. Edward! <laughs> he, really, he really is not there. He was, he was there last night. <laughs> anyway, as you can see, Patrick Hitchcock, he liked to say in the background. But he was born in Old Deerfield, just like a, what, maybe less than a mile down the road on the campus of uh, Deerfield Academy. He was the headmaster of Deerfield Academy, president of Amherst College, an incredible guy, and uh, I'm just amazed that he's not there. Um, as, as we look at the, the Connecticut Valley, uh, think of this not just as a bunch of dinosaur footprints, but with the dinosaurs are here, it's a whole ecosystem. So we find that there's going to be all sorts of fossil evidence here of reptiles, amphibians, fish, clams, crustaceans, plants, of course. And now I'm going to tell you about armored mud balls because that's my main claim to fame in the Connecticut River Valley here in the whole geological history, because I am the discoverer of armored mud balls in the Connecticut River Valley. And so let me tell you all that. <laughs> so uh, let me tell you, this is like the Genesis rock for armored mud balls. And when I first came here many decades, decades ago, I you know, was looking my way around. I came from California, parked by the Connecticut River over in Turner's Falls, looked around. There was this outcrop there, which turned out to be, this is not actually an outcrop. This is a, a foundation for a cable anchor of a suspension bridge that went from Gill to Turner's Falls. Uh, it sounds torn down. But there was a parking area right there. And there was the river just off to your right. And there was this. I put the six-inch ruler there. But look at those round things. Everybody in this room would get up and walk five paces to look at those round things. And when you look closely, you say, well, OK, that's a sandy mud. And there's pebbles all stuck right into the edge of the sandy mud. The rock that you see here is a quarried stone, but it's a classic river channel deposit. So I said, OK, that's mud. That's what's called the armor. Those are armored mud balls. So here's a close-up. I put the dime there, of course. Otherwise, that would be a great dating technique. We would know exactly when that formed. <laughs> uh, but it's an armored mud ball. And they're very rare. They're only found in about 10 other places in the world, preserved in rock that is lithified. You find uh, quite a few evidences that have rolled down streams. But of course, once the sun comes out, they're going to disintegrate. But anyway, these are armored mud balls. And uh, as some of you know, I've been very proud to um, have some of these named after me. All the armored mud balls that are less than two inches are called the little. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, so we're splitting Panju. That's what we're doing here. The messes are. We're splitting Panju. We've got the Rift Valley, and into the Rift Valley we have these fissure flows that come out. We do not have big volcanoes that came out. This is a very interesting thing because the flows came out, but they and they are volcanic, right? Because lava is volcanic, but we don't have a volcano. Probably some cinder cones and things, and spatter cones certainly. But no big volcano. Because if we had big volcanoes, look at the rocky outcrops of a volcano. They're circular outcrops because the volcano is a cone form. Or they might be the old neck of the volcano that would give us pillars like uh, Devil's Tower. So we don't have that, but we do have extensive flood basalts. And may I say that one of the world's experts in flood basalts is here. That's uh, uh, Omar oh Tony. <laughs> I have just blanked on your last name. Oh my god. Oh, tell me. Oh, of course. Tony Zilbots. There he is. I'm so sorry. I obviously know that for years and years, but damn, it's been too many years too many names. All right, so anyway, the Catanic River Valley, there's our Mesozoic Age Valley, and it's once again the in inlay right in the uh, fabric of New England. So, where are we? There's the Eagle Brook School, there's the star. Uh, here's the lava ridge, because the lava flow came out, but it's been tilted, as I'll show you in just a second. So we're, on, we're looking at the edge of this lava flow that's up behind us. And if you get a chance to explore and go up the road, you can see those outcrops that illustrate this situation. But I will tell you that the main edge of this ridge called the Wakantuck Range is actually a hard sedimentary layer, which you can see in Mount Sugarloaf. The lava is just in behind that. It turns out the lava is a little, in this area, is a little bit weaker to erosion than the sedimentary rock right under it. So basically, our valley is like a sandwich. We have the rift valley, the sediments that, that come in first. Then we have this lava flow that kind of forms the middle of the valley. And then there's more sediments that come on top. But the sandwich is tilted because of the movements on the eastern border fault. And now, if you erode the sandwich, you're going to find that the soft areas are going to be eaten away, shall we say, and the hard areas will stick up. And so this next line will show you the landscape. So we take the basic packet of sediments with the lava in the middle and we erode them. Uh, the lava flow is just about exactly 200 million years old, which gives you some idea about how old these rocks are. And we are here right at this boundary between the sediments and then the hard lava just behind us. Okay, we're gonna hop up to the ice ages next. So we get to the ice ages. The last ice age was at its maximum only 20,000 years ago. So that's amazing, isn't it? 20,000 on the geological scale. We're not, not talking billions of years anymore, or hundreds of millions. Now, we have this glacial lake here called the Lake Hitchcock. It starts in central Connecticut, somewhere around 18,000 years ago. And then as the ice melts, it gets longer and longer, all the way up to Westburg, Vermont, and over here, uh, Littleton, New Hampshire. It goes all the way up that far. So it's a very, very long lake. And it's named after Edward Hitchcock. There he is. He didn't escape this slide. <laughs> so it's named after Edward Hitchcock. And this is some. Uh, a representation of what it certainly could have looked like. So here's what we see, that the Berkshires are the hard rock mountains up there in the distance, Eagle Brook, about 50 feet above the lake level, and the main areas of Deerfield are on the old lake bottom. So one of the things that happens to glacial lakes would be the building of deltas. It's a big story here. So deltas, every time rivers come into lakes or, or the ocean, but in this case, we're talking Lake Hitchcock. We have deltas. Here's a representation of a delta. The delta has these parts, and pardon me if you all just know this, but there's the lake shore. The top of a delta is on the top set part, but underwater, there's these very interesting foreset beds that are de deposited at the angle of rest of sand and gravel, fine gravel in water. So they're up at an angle of around 30 degrees many times. If you go into a gravel bed, this is what you see. You actually see, if you have a recently exposed uh, gravel surface here, you will see these layers that are flat, and directly under, you see these layers that are at an angle. 
Now, if you don't know your genealogy of deltas, you would be extremely perplexed by this because you think that, oh my god, we have recent earthquakes that have taken these formerly flat layers and tilted them. And then we have an erosion <laughs> episode. It looks like an angular unconformity if you have Geo 101. But in any event, this is the normal deposition in a delta. How many people have been into delta gravel pits and seen this? Oh my god, look at that. So, this is really pretty exciting. Now, loads of people have been in gravel pits, and I usually say, how many people have been in gravel pits in the daytime? <laughs> <laughs> so, this is the depositional pattern that you see as the river is coming in. It's going to build these underwater, and then the top set layers build up higher and higher as the four sets build outward. So we keep building and building and building. Stream flow, as you see, there's the arrow. and the contact between top sets and four sets uh, is the contact, that's the short one. So the top set, four set contact is greatly appreciated by geologists because people will go out and measure that exact elevation that will tell us the shoreline elevation of Lake Hitchcock. Okay, now, what happens on the bottom of the lake is there's loads of muddy water coming out of glacial environments because they are so good at grinding up rock. They give us the mud that's going to go into the lake bottom. And these are known as barbs, by the way, because in the wintertime, when the lake is frozen, we'll get a much finer layer settling out. But in the melting season, it's more silty. And each pair of layers is going to represent a year. And I think most everyone here knows this because it's an amazing thing that happens in lakes, and we can actually count um, 4,000 different yearly layers here in Lake Utah. And so, the big question, were there Paleo-Indians and Lake Hitchcock, swimming in Lake Hitchcock, perhaps? Well, the ice front was in the Pioneer Valley about 16,000 years ago, and the lake drained by 14,000 years ago, so that will give you a time frame to think about. And of course, it's always a little bit confusing because these are calendar year dates estimates and not radiocarbon date estimates. And I'm sure if you've been <coughs> involved in archaeology, you certainly know that there's a difference between uh, calendar years and the radiocarbon interval. Have you heard the giant beaver story? Yeah. Uh, you've, all, you've all heard that one? Okay, you love that. So, here we go. The Bokomtak Indian tribe from Deerfield, Mass, right here in our backyard. They have a legend, large lake, and there was this big beaver that was eating people. They didn't like that. So they called on this uh, spirit giant to kill the beaver. The giant did that by hitting it in the back of the neck with a stick, killed the beaver, the beaver turned to stone. Okay. Great story. This is where the beaver lies, right? <laughs> so Mount Sugarloaf just down the road, that's ahead. The There's the blow from the sick, and this is the back of the beaver. Okay, so were the uh, Hitchcock, were the Indians living along Hitchcock? Well, you know what, I asked uh, Dr. Tate Curran this very question, because it gets asked to me a lot. So this conversation goes back to 2013. People presenting today will definitely talk about this with uh, more details than I'm going to give you. But in any event, there are Paleo-Indian sites on the shorelines, the Pocomtuck people refer them, and I won't even tell you what that word is, but the beaver tail hill people. And so, does the giant beaver myth indicate that people knew about Lake Hitchcock? And Dr. Curran says yes. So, how about that? Um, let's take a look about waterfalls for a second here, because Indians and waterfalls really go together because that's where your fish food would basically uh, definitely come from, because it's a great place for fishing. So if we take a look at the origin of the Connecticut River waterfalls, we find that with Lake Hitchcock here, there are all these deposits. And when the lake drained, the river could come back to its valley. But the river didn't know where its old, uh, its old preglacial valley was, because it was all covered in. So as it came back to those surface deposits, it then has to cut down. And when it cuts down, sometimes it finds itself on top of bedrock ridges which means it's going to fall over the edge of the ridge and it's going to create a waterfall. So if we take a look at the Connecticut River, we have uh, Turnus Falls, of course, but just upstream from Turnus Falls, there's this very interesting barrier here called the Lily Pond Barrier, and those 
are old plunge pools from when this barrier went completely across and the river went over that bedrock ridge and it created a series of three waterfalls. Waterfalls always eat back, they're very erosive, they eat back upstream and obviously right here it ate back enough in this area to breach the Lily Pond Barrier. And today the Connecticut River goes through these narrows on its way past Turns Falls. Okay, so these abandoned waterfalls were here after Lake Hitchcock. And so if people were here during Lake Hitchcock time, they were certainly here directly after Lake Hitchcock drained. And these would have been the sites of great fishing locations. Um, I'm sure this is going to be discussed later today by Peter Thomas. Uh, here's uh, just another view, Google Earth view. There's the three waterfalls. The Turns Falls Dam is right there. So, where was the Lake Hitchcock shoreline? The, uh, based on the top set, four set contacts, in the Greenfield area, the shoreline is around 300 feet above sea level. If we take a look at the Deerfield Valley, the Deerfield River comes out of the hills there to the left. From the west, there was a delta, delta that was built into Lake Hitchcock. And lake bottom deposits are also all over the place here. Oops, there should have been a slide there. Well, uh, that, that is strange. Sometimes when you switch computers, since my program is on a different computer than I did it, sometimes strange things happen. Mm -hmm. Edward Hitchcock. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, this would show Route 91 going across the Connecticut River. If you came down Route 91, you might have seen a big gravel pit right here, which is actually very sandy. These are Lake Florida Sands. Anyway, um, let's just go on. So here we are looking closer at where we are located. Eagle Brook is going to be uh, right here. And the lake shore is at 300 feet. So here's our 300 foot contour line running along. And you notice that, that there's no really big deposit here along our shoreline because we're just on a peninsula in the lake, or an island in the lake, you see. So there's no source for a tremendous amount of sand to make a big beachy area here along the lake, along the lake shore. So there's not much here showing Lake Hitchcock shoreline. However, I think as you go down the road, you find a cemetery that's a nice little flat spot there. It's very sandy. And uh, I must say, I've never dug in the cemetery. Many <laughs> people have done that. But, um, that's probably the shoreline. So right now, we're somewhere above 350 feet. See, we're above the old shoreline. So this is really a good view across the lake shore. Would be, right? Just a nice view off to the west. Now, look at these flat areas. That's definitely something that needs some discussion. So that flat area is under 300 feet. That's a shoreline at 300 feet. And what we have next <coughs> is the lake floor. And of course, the lake floor elevation will vary a bit depending on how much mud is washed into the lake and how much gets deposited. But the lake floor is very, very flat. Look at that. It also gets eroded in a, a high density of stream patterns. So you can see there's loads of little streams cutting through, gullying into those muds. And you see it on the other side of the valley, too. Look at the flat pad that's way over there as well. So this is an area that was all lake bottom clay all the way across the valley, which is really neat to think about because today there's the Deerfield River, an agent of erosion that removed that. How long did it take? 14,000 years. So in 14,000 years, we've removed 100 feet of clay across the, across the Deerfield River Valley in this section. And if you think that's absolutely astounding, well, it's just clay, it's easily eroded, and if you remember what happened during Hurricane Irene, there was a tremendous water flow coming through here, so it's, it's, uh, it happens. So all the way from South Deerfield to Greenfield, we had this clay layer over 100 feet thick, and much of it is now gone, and down the road is Deerfield Academy. And when you look at Deerfield Academy, it's on an elevation, nice flat surface here, elevation 160. So it's underneath the old lake bed, because the lake bed was around 230 or so. 
So it's on the classic river terrace. So as the lake, after the lake drained, the river came back to this valley, went side to side, eroding the valley. And as we look down on Deerfield Academy here, there's their science building. Uh, there's an upper terrace right there. There's a lower terrace right there. So it's where the river has been cutting back and forth across the valley and ever downward. And so as we look down on Deerfield, you can see that there's old river channels all over the place from the Deerfield River doing its work going back and forth across the valley. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I think I'm actually on time today. In conclusion, the Connecticut River Valley is the best place in the world to study geology. We have all these wonderful events just laid out before us. And what has been seen cannot be unseen. <laughs> <laughs>